Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is this thing coming out of Rhode Island. There was a bill proposed by two Rhode Island senators on March 1st, and I just wanna know what your thoughts on this are. So here's an overview of the bill. The bill requires that internet service providers will implement a digital blocking capability that renders inaccessible sexual content or, quote, patently offensive material. ISPs must also establish a reporting mechanism such as a website or call center to allow a consumer to report unblocked sexual content or potentially offensive material or report blocked material that is not sexual content or potentially offensive. They must also ensure that all child pornography and revenge pornography is inaccessible. Additionally, the attorney general or a consumer may seek damages up to $500 for each piece of content that was reported but not subsequently blocked. And the true kicker of this bill is that consumers may deactivate the digital block for a one-time $20 fee. But the proceeds from those those fees will be donated to the U.S. Council on Human Trafficking, which combats modern slavery and human trafficking. Now that bill overview explained, I, I want to throw in my opinion here. One, I hope that we can all agree that modern slavery, human trafficking, child pornography, revenge porn, bad horrible, should be stopped, and the perpetrators of which should be punished. But I find it incredibly concerning that all of those horrible things, they're being packaged together with all sexual content and whatever the hell patently offensive material is supposed to cover. Offensive to who? What's the basis? Also, how horrible is this content really if you're like, but if you give us 20, you can have it. Also, morality aside, let's think of it just from a business standpoint. Like yes, block the child pornography, the revenge porn, but they're saying ISPs out of their own pocket, they need to create a product to block the prawn. They then need to create and then hire for a support system. Consumers are being charged, but none of that money is going to the ISP to actually help build this system. And on top of that, if one thing slips through, they're gonna be fined $500 per. That is batshit crazy. And, and really, just by creating this ban, all you're really doing is promoting VPNs. Right, more and more people are using VPNs every day, mostly for security, but some people use it to get past region blocking. Also, if you wanna turn an American into an activist, go after their porn. And not only going after their porn, but going after their porn with a bill that if someone votes no, you're like, oh, well, I guess you're in support of child pornography and revenge porn. I guess you're for slavery and sex trafficking. Also, in a bill that seems purposefully vague, not only because we don't know what they're going to call offensive, but it just says sexual content. So does that mean if I'm watching HBO Go or Netflix and some nipples pop out, boom, and I have to pay $20 to find out what happens to Khaleesi because sometimes she doesn't like clothes? I guess my main point is to Senator Frank Jacone, Senator Hannah Gallo, your idea and proposal is patently offensive to me. Go fuck yourselves and have a fantastic day. That said, I do want to pass the question off to you, nation. I know I have my opinions and I want to hear yours. You agree? you disagree, you're somewhere in the middle, I'd love to know your thoughts. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today an awesome, actually kind of perfectly brought to you by NordVPN. A VPN, if you're not familiar, allows you to securely access a private network, share data remotely through public networks. It's kinda like how a firewall protects your data on your computer, VPNs protected online. NordVPN specifically has over 1,000 super fast servers in 61 countries and absolutely no data logging. You save on everything, your computer, your Android, your iOS device. They have 24-7 customer service, and you can try it completely risk-free because they have a 30-day money back guarantee. And so if you want to start protecting your internet experience today, go to nordvpn.org slash phil, where you can actually get 77% off a three-year plan right now. And the first bit of awesome is if you're someone that wants more Philip DeFranco show, yesterday there actually was. Yesterday on top of the Philip DeFranco show, I also shot out another six-minute story that it was just too long to put into the PDS. It would have made the show about three hours late. Last night I ended up posting it by itself on our second channel, youtube.com slash philly d. link to that video down below if you want to watch it. It's kind of a one-time thing, but also along with that, if we find ourselves in situations like that, which we actually might today. What would you think about me releasing that by itself early in the morning the next day? That way on some days you get double the filling. I might test it out. Then we got the Honest Game trailer for Bayonetta. We got the season two trailer for a series of unfortunate events. Jimmy Kimmel giving us some more mean tweets. The Honest trailer for Thor Ragnarok, which I will say I just watched the movie again. I still love it so much. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just share the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about one of the most requested stories of the past 24 hours. And that is this story that involves Lithuania and a conspiracy conspiracy slash cover up. And to fully explain the situation, we have to go back to the early 2000s. Also a note, because we're talking about people from Lithuania and I can't pronounce half the names nor find the pronunciation of half the names, I am just going to use their initials. So DK and LS have a baby in 2004. They end up having a very bitter custody battle for the baby, but ultimately
ultimately LS gets custody in 2006, but DK is granted visitation right. Then in 2008, DK said he was with his daughter when she told him that men had been licking her at her mother's house. DK then makes a one hour long video of his daughter describing the sexual abuse from men. It's a very uncomfortable video. She mimes a man with a penis and says that cream dripped out of it, which he then put on her. So then DK reports his daughter's account to the police. As a result of these accusations, DK gets full custody, but very oddly, there were no charges filed. And so then in 2009, DK went public with these accusations, giving the video of his daughter describing these acts to news outlets. And additionally, he went public with accusations against Andres Yusas, AU, a businessman and advisor to a speaker of parliament, his local district judge, JF, along with the mother and her sister for enabling the abuse. The mother's contact with AU sounds like they were dating, but that's not confirmed. DK also claiming that the police were purposefully not investigating the accusations because of the status of who he was accusing. But the police claimed that DK was not cooperating with their investigation. Then in October of 2009, the judge, JF, was shot dead in what appeared to be a planned attack. Reportedly, he got into an accident with another car. When JF got out of the car, he was then shot three times in the stomach and one time in the head. That same day, reportedly, the mother's sister was also found dead. She was shot in the doorway of her home. And the authorities said they discovered that the same gun had been used in both murders. And based on the situation, the police believed that DK was the perpetrator, but authorities could not locate him. And a note here is that at this time, public opinion was on his side. So many people believe that he did commit the murders, but that he committed the murders to protect his daughter from a corrupt system. Now, because DK was missing, his daughter ended up living with his sister, Judge NV. Then the next thing we see is in February of 2010, Prosecutor General AV resigns after public criticism of how he handled DK's case. But also a thing of note is at that time, there were also general allegations of corruption against the prosecution service. That said, many people took this resignation as confirmation of a cover-up. Though statements from other officials point towards the need for public trust, which he did not have. Then in April of that year, DK was found dead and the gun used in the double murder was found near his body. And at the time, authorities said that he died due to vomiting caused by alcohol abuse, but also reportedly no vomit was found. DK's family then hires a private investigator who disputes the police's claim, instead saying that he was drowned. Then in May, the court decides the daughter should be returned to the mother. There were massive protests and demonstrations because of this, including one outside of Envy's house who had the girl at the time, and so police were actually unable to get the girl. Also, this movement ended up being successful. The court actually reversed their decision, which was an unprecedented move. But then in June, there's another death. AU is found dead under mysterious circumstances. Then in December of 2011, the mother wins custody of the daughter back from the end. There were then multiple attempts to remove the girl, but demonstrators once again stopped them. All of that lasting until May of 2012, when 250 police officers showed up and removed the girl. Then in October of that year, NV gets elected to the Lithuanian parliament after starting a new party called the Way of Courage. She ran a campaign that was largely set on getting rid of corruption. And her being elected was a big deal because it gave her legal immunity. And this was incredibly important because in October, there were charges filed against her, which were connected to the custody issue. Which then brings us to April of 2013, where other members of parliament voted to remove her legal protections. And so the next thing we know is that NV and her son disappear, authorities figuring that they left the country. And for years, while those charges have been looming, no one really knew where she was. Which brings us to why we're talking about this today. Yesterday, NV's son, Carlos Venkis, posted a video on YouTube explaining his mother's situation. What we know now is that they went to the United States seeking asylum. He said they're still in the midst of an asylum case, but two weeks ago, NV was detained in Chicago and is facing extradition to Lithuania. He also says that his mother is now charged with 39 crimes, including contempt of court, assault, illegal surveillance, psychological molestation. He also said that members of his family and people in their proximity, neighbors, supporters, they're also facing charges in Lithuania. Carolus also said that there's no chance for his mother to receive a fair trial in Lithuania and has asked people to sign a petition to protect her from going back. And currently, there are over 24,000 signatures with a goal of 100,000. And so that's where we are right now. This whole story is a weird, weird rabbit hole. There are weird circumstances, a lot of people making a lot of claims. Even the president of Lithuania said, if I were able to say where the truth is and who is right, I would have done so long ago. Unfortunately, the whole story is very complicated and corrupted by investigators from the beginning. Also, there was a debate of, are we looking at a situation where there was corruption, there was a cover-up, a pedophile ring, or are we looking at a situation where it was a custody battle that went horribly, horribly wrong? I have no idea. I'm very interested to see what happens next. Also, what happens with the petition? Does this end up getting more attention? It becomes a bigger story. This is an old story for Lithuania with now a new update, but this is very fresh for a lot of new people. And so I'll pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around this situation? Then let's talk about the Stormy Daniels, Donald Trump situation, because I cannot believe where this story started and where we are now. This feels like one of the slowest moving sex scandals that I felt would have gone away 
multiple times, but it has just escalated. So first I'm gonna hit you with the TLDR of uh, how we got to this point today and then tell you the update. It gets reported that Trump had an affair with Stormy Daniels back in 2006 at the time he was married to Melania. The White House denies it. Michael Cohen releases a letter that Stormy Daniels appears to have signed that denies it as well. As far as why Daniels was denying that this happened, there were reports that Stormy Daniels was paid $130,000 for signing a non-disclosure agreement. In Touch Magazine says they have an unpublished interview with Daniels from 2011 where she detailed the encounter. They then publish that interview and it gives the details of what Stormy said happened during this affair. Then January 30th, a new letter was released that was allegedly signed by Stormy Daniels in which she denied the affair again. Stormy Daniels then gives a very weird interview on Jimmy Kimmel where she denies that it was her signature. Did you sign this letter that was released today? I don't know, did I? Wait a minute, that you can but say, right? that does right? not look like my signature, does it? Then, after having denied many accusations February 13th, Trump's lawyer Michael Cohen said not only was Stormy Daniels paid $130,000, he paid her using his own personal funds, going on to state that the Trump Organization nor Trump campaign had anything to do with the payment, and arguing that because he did it that way, the payment was lawful because no one reimbursed him for the payment either directly or indirectly. And that was a key point because a government watchdog group called Common Cause, they filed a complaint with the Federal Election Commission about the payment, saying that the money paid to Daniels was an unreported in-kind contribution to and expenditure by President Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Cohen denied the allegations and then refused to answer any follow-up questions. Then on March 5th, the Wall Street Journal reports that the bank Cohen allegedly used to wire the money to Daniels First Republic Bank, they saw the money as suspicious and reported it to the Treasury Department. The Journal also reporting that Cohen reportedly complained to friends that he was never reimbursed for the payment. And to that, Cohen responded to the report with the two-word email statement, fake news. Also, while all of this was happening, because Cohen started talking, it was being reported that Stormy Daniels felt that he had broken the NDA, so she was going to be sharing her story soon. Which then brings us to yesterday. Stormy Daniels is now suing Donald Trump. She's filed a civil suit in Los Angeles Superior Court, and according to the complaint, Miss Clifford, Stormy Daniels' real last name, began an intimate relationship with Mr. Trump in the summer of 2006 in Lake Tahoe and continued her relationship with Mr. Trump well into the year 2007. This relationship included, among other things, at least one meeting with Mr. Trump in a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel located within Los Angeles County. The complaint then goes on to state that Daniels wanted to publicly disclose her story around the time the grabber by the pussy tape came out, and that quote, after discovering Miss Clifford's plans, Mr. Trump, with the assistance of his attorney, Mr. Cohen, aggressively sought to silence Miss Clifford as part of an effort to avoid her telling the truth, thus helping to ensure he won the presidential election. Mr. Cohen subsequently prepared a draft non-disclosure agreement and presented it to Miss Clifford and her attorney, which was then signed by Clifford and Cohen on or around October 28th, just days before the election. The complaint also goes on to state that Daniels is not seeking money, per se. Rather, she's looking to have her non-disclosure agreement concerning her relationship with Trump declared invalid because Trump never signed the agreement. And I say per se, because obviously if, if the NDA is thrown out, there, there are many lucrative opportunities for her. That said, according to the suit, Daniels is looking for, quote, a judgment declaring that no agreement was formed between the parties or in the alternative. To the extent an agreement was formed, it is void, invalid, or otherwise unenforceable. And attached to these filings are two documents that purportedly make up the non-disclosure agreement. At the top of the first document, the two parties to the agreement are given pseudonyms. The pseudonyms are David Dennison, DD, and Peggy Peterson, PP. And the second document is a side letter agreement that purportedly identifies the true people behind the pseudonyms. And while the name is blacked out in the document, the filing claims that David Dennison is Donald Trump. And at the bottom of both agreements are several signature lines. And you'll notice the first signature has the letters DD for David Dennison underneath and the line is blank. The other signatures included, you have Stephanie Clifford with PP, Peggy Peterson, a signature from a notary representing EC LLC, Essential Consultants, which is the shell company that Cohen allegedly set up to facilitate the payment to Daniels. And then there are two more signatures from Daniels' lawyer and Michael Cohen. And according to the complaint, Trump purposefully did not sign the agreement. The complaint stated, Mr. Trump purposefully did not sign the agreement so he could later, if need be, publicly disavow any knowledge of the Hush Agreement and Miss Clifford. And it appears that a large part of what this case comes down to is whether or not a judge believes that Cohen signing the document on behalf of Trump is enough to make the agreement valid, or if Trump should have been required to sign the document himself. Trump's attorneys could also argue that Trump, but also not Trump because he doesn't know about this and Cohen only knew about this and was the person who paid, that he, but not he, fulfilled his, but not his, end of the bargain by paying out $130,000 to Daniels and so the agreement is valid. And so it'll be very interesting to see what the final decision is on this case. If the NDA is found to be invalid, we find out more. If it is found to be valid, then she's most likely going to get stuck in arbitration hell. It would be out of the court system and not a matter of public record anymore. Also, I know what I want to hit on is if you actually look at the alleged NDA, it's very interesting. Specifically, because it states that Daniels agreed that any existing images, text messages, and property has been turned
turned over to David Dennison's attorney. And so of course when you hear images, that, that brings up one of two situations. One, where they worried about screenshots of text messages and things like that. Or we talked about more pictures of them together, sex tape, dick pics, stuff like that. Now as far as whether those images actually exist or not, Daniels' attorney said this. That's a question that Ms. Daniels will have to ultimately answer. Do you know the answer to that question? I, I do know the answer and I'm not at liberty to disclose that this morning. On the note of where did the $130,000 come from, he said this. We think it's highly questionable as to whether it came from his personal funds. You think the president knew about it? There's no question the president knew about it at the time. Uh, the idea that an attorney would go off on his own without his client's knowledge and engage in this type of negotiation and enter into this type of agreement, quite honestly, I think is ludicrous. Well, you make that inference, but you don't know. Or can you prove that the president knew about this payment? We certainly haven't disclosed all the facts and evidence that we're aware of in connection with this as it relates to the filing of the complaint. And there's many other additional facts and evidence that we have, and we think that's going to come to light. And to the question of, well, why did Stormy Daniels previously deny that this had happened, he said. That was a statement that was uh, demanded that she sign. Mr. Cohen demanded she sign that statement. And as alleged in the complaint, uh, we believe that it's uh, that it was done through force and intimidation. And then flipping it back to the White House, when the White House was asked about these new developments, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said this. The president has addressed these directly and um, made very well clear that uh, none of these allegations are true. Uh, this case has already been, been won in arbitration and anything beyond that I would refer you to the president's out outside counsel. There was no knowledge of uh, any payments from the president and he's denied all of these allegations. And so that's where we are right now. Now as, as much as I, I want to look at kind of a sex scandal and kind of scoff because there are so many other things in the world, this is actually kind of a big deal. And when you look to Stormy Daniels and you think about her intentions, you know, is it because she wants truth to be out there or is she looking for a payday? That, that, that kind of becomes a side point, right? Like I'm not in Stormy Daniels' camp here. But when we look to the president and his lawyer, Michael Cohen, I mean, we're, we're looking at a very troubling situation. One, it's incredibly hard for me to believe that Donald Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, just paid a woman $130,000 without Donald Trump's knowledge. And two, while I don't give a fuck if Donald Trump cheated on his wife one time, multiple times, do not care. Like Donald Trump having consensual sex with a woman that wasn't his wife more than a decade ago, I, I could give a fuck about that. But it's the seemingly attempted cover up, the lying, the potential legal issues that we're talking about. When you have the president of the United States and or his administration and or his legal counsel lying, in this specific situation, not only are you potentially talking about crimes, specifically around funds, any story like this opens people up to political manipulation, right? I mean, when we're talking about the White House security clearance has been a big story for the past few months. If people have information on you domestically or internationally, you can be manipulated because you might not want some truth getting out. Whether it be Porter and the multiple accusations of spousal abuse, or with a Stormy Daniels situation. But all of that said, that's pretty much where this story ends for now until we get a legal decision. With that said, of course, I'd love to know your thoughts on this story. And that's actually where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you like this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed the last Philip DeFranco show, you wanna catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you need something a little lighter, we have the behind the scenes vlog, you can click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.